Assalamu alaikum, and we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming uh, tonight. Uh, we, we, we have a presentation by uh, a Dr. Han uh, on the prophecy of Muhammad Begum. And with that being said, uh, Dr. Han, you have Yes, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, my um, uh, reason for this presentation here, and I am grateful to Brother Bashir, who's doing some fantastic work, is to elucidate this particular prophecy. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is if whenever you ask any Murabi about the Muhammadi Begum prophecy, uh, you get a variety of different responses. And one of the standard responses, oh, we've answered this prophecy and there are many other, they then direct you to certain websites, uh, Amadi answers or some video by some Murabi trying to explain it. And what they never do is tell us the whole story. And one of the reasons why I made a presentation about it to make it very clear and chronological was a recent video that came, I think, in September by a chap called Mr. Asif Basit, who's pretty high up in the Jamaat. And he uh, claimed to have discovered new revelations, new um, uh, findings in some research that he did. But I'm going to demonstrate that these are not new findings. And that it is again another game of smoke and mirrors, Bashir, because what they're doing is they're trying to uh, distract into other areas that have nothing to do with the prophecy itself. Uh, it's a pretty entangled business with lots of people involved in it. So without much ado, uh, Bashir, if you would be able to present my uh, PowerPoint presentation, which has with each slide, there is an audio commentary. So I don't need to elaborate. If it works, then uh, we can use it that way. If that's okay with you, totally. Uh, can you can you share the screen so I can so I can pull up the PowerPoint? Um, yeah. Is it the window I should share? Uh, actually, I don't remember. <laughs> but I think you had it on your desktop as well. Yeah, yeah. So I can pull it up. Yes, uh, you can pull it up because uh, it might be easier for you. Okay. Sounds good. So I'm I'm gonna pull this up, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, well, let's see how it goes. Um, let me uh, let me just find it. I think there's like another it's way. Parts. It's part one and part two because it's a big pr presentation uh, because of the audio uh, in it. Okay. Here we go. I'm gonna share my entire screen and. Uh, you should be able to see it, and yeah. I'll play the audio. And here we go. Assalamu alaikum. Um, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. My name is Dr. Izhar Khan, and in this presentation, I will uh, discuss the background, the details, and the outcome of the famous Muhammadi Begum prophecy uh, that was made by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian in 1888. Recently, an Ahmadi who goes under the name of Umar Dilemma, Mr. Asif uh, Basit has produced a video trying to prove yet again um, and claiming to have found new information uh, from his research, uh, which to be honest is information that is out in the public domain and uh, many of us knew about it uh, for a long time. So I will, try to, I will try to explain the details of this prophecy in simple chronological order uh, in complete detail without leaving out any of the important details that you will often see will not be covered by Amadis and Amadi Murabis. The Muhammadi Begum prophecy is an important prophecy because it was one of the three great prophecies that Mirza Ghulam Ahmed uh, claimed uh, would prove um, his veracity in terms of the claims of Mujaddid, Muhaddis, and ultimately a Mahdi and a prophet, etc., etc. He stated that one way of testing the veracity of his claims was to judge him by his prophecies, and that even if one of these failed, his claims would be false. This prophecy, in fact, preoccupied him and his followers from the date it was first made public in 1888, right until he passed away, and was one of his self-proclaimed great prophecies. 
as i have mentioned before, ahmadis tried desperately to try to prove the success of the prophecy and recently have launched yet another um, video and an article uh, in which uh, they claim to provide new uh, breaking news information. Uh, but I can tell you that this information was in the public domain and many of us knew about it for a long time. I have often thought of uh, the whole Muhammad Begum affair uh, like um, Shakespearean tragedy or, or opera buffo. Um, it um, is important for us, first of all, to uh, acquaint ourselves with the dramatis personae of this affair. And we will start with Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who was the race or feudal landlord of Qadian and, um, and made the claim of being a Mujaddid at that time. Um, he was the instigator of this prophecy. We need to know about his two cousins from his uh, paternal uncle, uh, Ghulam Muhyuddin. These two are Mirza Imam Din and Mirza Nizam Din, uh, first cousins of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed and sons of his paternal uncle. They opposed Mirza Sahib's claims and they also had engaged in uh, property disputes, uh, planning permission disputes with Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. And like many families, they didn't get on uh, with cousins, uh, with their cousin Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. Uh, Ahmed Baig, um, in green are the um, individuals who are the specific who were the specific targets of the Muhammad Begum prophecy, uh, who the prophecy specifically addressed. Ahmed Baig of Sharpur, he's the father of Muhammad Begum and married to a sister of Imam Din and Nizam Din, and therefore married to a cousin of uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. Um, we can get a picture how closely related all these people were. So. Dan Ahmed was uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed's uh, eldest son, and he was married to a daughter of Imam Din, again, one of his first cousins. Um, Fazal Ahmed, uh, the quiet uh, Fazal Ahmed, was the younger son of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, and he was married to a daughter of Ahmed Baig's sister. So, um, and uh, both Sultan Ahmed and Fazal Ahmed were sons of Hurmat Bibi, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed's long-suffering first wife who had faced years of neglect from Mirza Ghulam Ahmed and eventually was divorced. The main character of the prophecy is Muhammadi Begum. She's the daughter of Ahmed Beg, the elder da eldest daughter of Ahmed Beg, and was eight or nine years old when it first mentioned in 1885 by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed before the act of prophecy was made. Um, and again, it was in hindsight that he mentions um, the, the, the girl's age um, at the time in 1885. Um, and therefore, when the prophecy was made, she would probably be 11 to 12 or maximum 13 year old girl. Lastly, there is Sultan Muhammad, who is not related to this family, and he was uh, Muhammad I Begum. He was from a village called Bhatti, and he was um, a soldier by profession and a uh, decent, honest, uh, practicing Muslim. So in the recent um, video by Mr. Barset, he put some, he's deflecting this prophecy onto another prophecy and conflating it with a prophecy uh, or a so-called revelation about Imam Din and Nizam Din, who were cousins of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. And so therefore it's important to know who were Imam Din and Nizam Din. They used to have disputes and they didn't get on with Mirza Ghulam Ahmed anyway regarding property disputes. In particular, um, they had uh, objected to planning permission for the construction of the Minaret al Masi, which is the minaret that Mirza Sahib had to construct or start constructing in order to fulfill the hadith that the Messiah would descend next to a white minaret in Damascus. Bear in mind, Qadian is a thousand miles away from Damascus, but this was one way of trying to prove his claim. Now, Imam Din um, and Nizam Din were both Muslims, and Imam Din became a peer. A peer is a sort of a spiritual head of a sect, and in this case, it was um, the sect called the Lalbegis, 
uh, who were a heterodox syncretic faith uh, that included Hindus and Muslims um, and they had a Muslim branch as well and so he started uh, being uh, he, he claimed to be their peer and they followed another peer called Balmik and so it's a syncretic sect and he used to hold melas every year, which some people think was the inspiration for Jalsa Salana, but I don't know about that. Uh, but he did um, engage with these groups. And they were his followers were mostly what are called in uh, Punjabi churas, or lower caste people who did menial jobs. In fact, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed took great umbrage at being confused with Imam Deen in one of the um, reports uh, by the government, a census report in which Ulam Ahmed was called the uh, mistakenly named the leader of the Churas. Um, but in fact, uh, he then had to put out a, an advert saying that my followers are very educated and rich people, etc. So uh, there are still some Lal Begis that exist in modern day Punjab in both India and Pakistan, interestingly. Um, in 1885, Mirza Sahib may, uh, had a revelation um, suggesting that there will be impending calamity will befall these two brothers, Nizam Deen and Imam Deen, within 31 months. And lo and behold, in 1888, he claimed it was fulfilled. Mirza Sahib claimed it was fulfilled because a daughter of Nizam Deen, not Imam Deen, mind you, uh, who was the Lal Begi, uh, she died. Uh, Mr. Bassett fails to mention that in the very year of 1888, Mirza Sahib himself lost a child, sadly, called Bashir. He was Bashir the first, <laughs> because he was supposed to be the uh, prophecy of Muslim out. But that is another story altogether. So Mirza Sahib himself, sadly, um, had to suffer this calamity. And uh, unfortunately, he lost four more children in 1891, 92, 03, and 07. So the, it's very important to remember that the prophecy about Nizam Deen was made in 1885 in Tadkirah, which is a book of revelations, three years before the Muhammad Begum prophecy. That's important to note. Mr. Bassett has been disingenuous in conflating Imam Deen and Nizam Deen with the Muhammad Begum prophecy. And right at the outset of his video, he seems to convey the impression that Imam Deen and Nizam Deen were the reason why the Muhammad Begum prophecy prophecy was made and nothing could be further from the truth as I will show you. Bassett also claims that Imam Deen and Nizam Deen had invited the Hindu um, Arya Samaj, Arya Dharam Lekram, leader Lekram to Kadian, for which he provides absolutely no evidence. There is a reference from a book by Lekram in the article in Al Hakam. But that is a copy of uh, an advert by Imam Deen or an istihar, an announcement by Imam Deen, asking Mirza Ghulam Ahmed for a sign. Um, and that was um, the uh, only uh, mention of Nizam Deen in a book by Dekran. But there is no evidence that he provided that Nizam Deen or Imam Deen um, invited uh, Dekran to Qadiyan. And this is the prophecy that was published in the uh, collection of uh, announcements or Majmu'ai Ishtiharat um, and um, against Nizam Deen and Imam Deen um, that within 31 months they would encounter a great misfortune. And then um, in 1888, he um, made another announcement, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, going back to this 1885 prophecy and how that was fulfilled. Uh, however, Mr. Bassett fails to mention that in this very same year, as I have said earlier, in 1888, Mirza Sahib sadly himself lost a child called Bashir. So it's clear that the Nizam Deen and Imam Deen prophecy is basically a separate issue. Um, they were all a close family, as we can see, mostly first cousins. Uh, intermarriage was common. Um, 
But the Mohammadi Begum prophecy, it's important to note, was uh, first mentioned in 1888 in Tathkira, the Book of Revelations. But the background to the prophecy is very important, um, and the detail of that is important. Ahmed Beg had a sister whose husband, again a cousin of Mirza Sahib called Ghulam Hussain, had disappeared for 25 years from the sea, and therefore deemed dead. Now, he had a piece of land worth about 5,000, which is a modest piece of land that um, Ahmed Beg's sister wanted to transfer to um, um, Ahmed Beg, her brother's son. And so there was a deed, um, deed of gift. Mirza Sahib, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Sahib, being the feudal landlord and Reis of Guardian, uh, had to be a co-signatory of that document in order to release that land to Ahmed Bey and his family. So Ahmed Bey politely asked Mirza Sahib and thought that he would sign it because Mirza Sahib uh, owned a lot of land and property. Um, Having said that, then Mr. Sahib uh, refused to sign the document and told Beg that he would first want to do an istikhara. An istikhara is a special prayer when you want to do a marriage, for example, to find out if that match is suitable and you may get some sort of a signal or an inspiration, uh, a divine inspiration, whether this is a good thing or a bad. A few days later, he returned to Ahmed Beg and said uh, that he still cannot sign the document unless his eldest 13-year-old daughter, Muhammadi, uh, was given to him in marriage. Now, this is a married man. He's, he's, he himself says that I was about 50 years at the time, or thereabouts, already married with two uh, married sons. It's not um, haram or not disallowed or illegal in, under Islamic law, uh, but it's still um, begs the question that if a man is approached by such a man to give his daughter in uh, marriage to that man, that man, Ahmed Beg, has every right to say, no, thank you very much. I'm not going to give you my daughter. And that's exactly what Ahmed Beg did. He refused. That then led to Mirza Sahib obviously um, not being very happy about it. And then a, a revelation appeared, uh, which was reported first in Tathkira in 1888. Now, it's very important to remember that Ahmadis will often quote the Ainai Kamalat Islam, which was a book written in 1893, one year after the death of Ahmad Beg, well into the duration of the prophecy. Um, but the original um, first mention that I could find was in Tathkara in 1888. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, <clears throat> that was part one. So um, you should have part two of the presentation. Sounds good. Yep. Uh, moving to part two right now. Um, While you're doing that, um, happy at the end. If anyone has any questions and wants to join, if you're happy, Bashir, we can do that. But, um, I think it's very important that Ahmadis, but this is directed for Ahmadis, really to understand the gist of this prophecy so that once and for all, any doubts can be removed. Sounds good. And uh, you want to go ahead and start part two? Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, here, here, here we go. So Mr. Saab also made announcements uh, in Majmua Ishtihara, um, Volume 1, um, and phrases and the references are given here. Um, remember, this is before yeah. Muhammad got married to Sultan Muhammad. And Mr. Saab writes that it is Allah's will that cannot be altered, that the girl will be um, uh, will have her in the car with him, with this humble mm -hmm. one, either as a uh, virgin or as a as a widow, and that Allah had said to Mirza Ghulam Ahmed that, and they ask you, is it true that you will marry her? Then say to them, I swear by Allah, yes, it is true, and you cannot stop this from happening. And Allah says, we have made your nikah already um, in heaven. Now, it's very important to note that Ahmadis will 
um, never admit the fact that the essence, according to Mirza Ghulam and the prophecy, was not the death of Ahmed Beg and not even the death of Sultan Ahmed. The essence he defines himself, again in a Majmua Istiharat, a public announcement, uh, volume 2, page 39 to 50. He, um, and, and, and this was uh, published uh, in 1894. Now remember, uh, we will come to it, what happened was that um, Mohammed Begum did get married in 1892, and by September 1894, the two and a half years within which Sultan Muhammad, her husband, was supposed to have died, didn't die. And so people started asking. They started leaving the um, fealty to uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed and left his jamaat. But here Mirza Ghulam Ahmed then is trying to again defend his position, uh, sadly, um, in a very pathetic manner. He says that, a calamity, i.e. Sultan Muhammad's death, can be postponed as such an event can be delayed. And he called it the taqdeer mu'allak, which means a fate that can be um, uh, withheld and suspended or delayed um, because of fear. Um, I don't know fear of what, but the nafs, he says, the nafs means the essence or the center, the heart of the prophecy, which is that a woman being married to me is inevitable. And he calls that uh, what is known as taqdeere mubram, i.e. something that cannot be reversed. Uh, because in this case, he claims that Allah's promise was irreversible. And Allah has used the words in ilham to me, i.e. ulam Ahmed, that my words, uh, these words cannot be changed and they are irrevocable. So any Ahmadi who says to you that um, well, Muhammad Begum repented, and we'll come to repentance and the issues around it later, um, is pulling the wool over your eyes because Mirza Ghulam Ahmed had already claimed that this girl is definitely going to be married to him because that is what Allah told him, and that was what was the Taddeere Mubra. Even until, almost till his dying days, and I have a reference from 1905, he continued uh, in the claim that ultimately this girl will be either divorced or widowed and will be married to me. It's almost bordering on harassment and stalking um, if this was, uh, if this happened uh, in today's uh, era. And Mirza Saab was a very clever wordsmith and um, he, or we don't know whether it was just he alone or with the help of others, um, he wrote prolifically and this is very clever. He, re he records the prophecy in hindsight, in retrospect, in 1893, the prophecy, remember, was made in 1888. Uh, by this time, Muhammad Begum had been married in 1892 to Sultan Muhammad. Um, and then Mr. Saab in his book, Aina Kamalat Islam, which was published in 1893, again reviews this prophecy and goes on to say that, well, um, marriage to anyone else will not prove blessed for the person she marries, nor for her father, nor for her, uh, and that um, if he did not comply with his request, he would be afflicted with misfortunes. Remember, by this time, Ahmed Beg has died. So Mr. Ghulam Ahmed can say that, look, um, I have warned him. Uh, Allah has told me that the daughter of Ahmed Beg will be betrothed to me and will be my wife. And this cannot be stopped. And this is important. Again, we come to the essence of the prophecy, which is the marriage of Mirza Sahib with this girl. He says, because it's an unalterable fate, because it is Allah's word. And if this does not happen, it will mean that Allah's word, Nazbillah, is not fulfilled. And in yet another uh, book called Shadat al-Quran, Ruhani Khazain, volume 6, page 376, again published in 1893, he describes by, you know, uh, Ahmed Beg 
had died, but Sultan Muhammad was still alive. Muhammadi Begum and they were married happily. So his adherents and his followers were saying to Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Sahib, when will you get married to this girl? Because the prophecy hasn't been fulfilled. So here, he again splits the prophecy into six components in retrospect. Um, number one, Mirza Ahmad Beg will die within three years of the marriage of um, Muhammadi Begum. Number two, the son-in-law with whom Muhammadi is married will die within two and a half years. That hadn't happened. Number three, Ahmed Beg will be alive till the daughter is married. Of course, um, he's writing in retrospect when points one and three have already happened. Uh, and now he's saying that these are the components of that prophecy which he had originally made in 88. Number four, that the daughter will stay alive until her second marriage. Of course, uh, he's still thinking that the, uh, he's claiming that the daughter will marry him. And of course, she'll be alive uh, at that time and that this humble man will not die until the above events happen right note that he died in 1900 so only one point uh, out of these six were achieved and yet again going back to the nafs of the prophecy the marriage with muhammadi begum you see that was the bottom line never happened um he also wrote that Muhammadi's fate will be accursed. Uh, that this was again going back in 1988, the original prophecy. He had said that Muhammadi's fate will be accursed and she will suffer if she's married to another man. That also never happened. Muhammadi lived quite happily. Um, and he goes on to say again in that Majmua Ishtiharat advert or public announcement that Allah had destined her to marry him. That didn't happen. This is again, uh, this is again another quite sordid aspect of this prophecy. Uh, Mirza Sahib believed that uh, for a prophet's prophecy, it was allowed to make efforts to have that prophecy fulfilled. And many people think, for example, that Lekram, who was stabbed by a man who was a Muslim, pretending that he wanted to convert to Hinduism and gained Lekram's confidence, um, uh, was. Um, it was a conspiracy that you know to in order to make the prophecy come true um, we know that uh, in uh, Abdullah Atham's case when the time of his death was approaching and he hadn't yet died they did a strange ritual of counting some lentils and throwing them into an abandoned well um, and then coming back without looking back uh, these sort of black magic type things in order to make a prophecy come true, but it didn't work anyway. Uh, in fact, I can confidently say that almost none of his prophecies uh, were fulfilled. Um, anyway, coming back to this one, this very sordid aspect of the Babsi was his efforts to make the prophecy come true. He threatened his own two sons, Fazl, who was married to a niece of Ahmed Beg's, and his son Sultan, who was married to the daughter of Imam Deen. He asked them to divorce their wives if Muhammadi was married to another man, or, or they would be disinherited. And as I have mentioned, he didn't even attend the uh, funeral of um, his, his, his younger son, Fuzzle. Moreover, he threatened to divorce his own long-suffering uh, first wife, uh, remember Hurmat Bibi, his cousin. He also wrote three letters, and he has, in al hakam admitted that these letters are genuine. One to Ahmed Beg, and remember, Mr. Basit claimed that Ahmed Beg and his families were anti-Islam. In fact, in the letter, he addresses him as a pious man. He wrote another letter to his brother-in-law, Ali Sher Beg, uh, Mr. Ahmed Beg's brother-in-law, offering bribes of not only will I sign that document, I will even give you more property. Uh, and of course, you, by marrying Muhammadi Begum, I will bring light into your family and blessings into your family. And again, it all is like an operatic sort of overture to uh, try to get this woman somehow to marry him. Um, he wrote a third letter, which was a rather sinister, threatening letter to the mother-in-law of Fazal. Uh, remember, that was um, uh, the 
uh, aunt uh, of the Khala of Mohammed Begum. And he wrote to her that he will order Fazl to divorce uh, her daughter and he will disinherit him unless she persuaded Beg to give him his daughter. And as we all know, he, she didn't do that. And she stuck with his son, his brother's decision uh, not to give Muhammadi in marriage to Mirza Ghulam. Mirza Sahab confirmed in Al Hakam that the letter to Ahmed Beg was authentic. So Ahmadis can't say that Mirza Sahab didn't regard him as a pious man and as a good Muslim. Fazl's wife, Izzat, under threat of divorce, is a fourth letter but written by Izzat, which is very heartbreaking. I have audio recordings of these letters. These were in Urdu, um, but they can be translated. But the essence was she wrote a letter to her mom, pleading with her to persuade Ahmed Beg to give Mirza Sahab his daughter's hand in marriage. So how did this prophecy fail? Number one, Muhammad Begum married an honest Muslim from Patti, Sultan Muhammad, in 1892. Her father did die six months later. Um, he was an old man and people did die. Um, and this was regarded as a great success at the time of the prophecy. But remember the six components and the nafs of the prophecy were never fulfilled. Sultan Muhammad and Muhammad Begum lived Happily, for many decades after Mirza Sahib died in 1908, Sultan Muhammad, in fact, was wounded in the head in the First World War in France um, and then recovered, made a, made a recovery. I think Mohammed Begum died in the 60s and uh, she's buried in Lahore with an inscription of the Kalama on her tomb. So all this talk about these people were not religious and anti-Islam is all welcome. Sultan Muhammad and Muhammad remained good practicing Muslims. The nafs or essence of the prophecy, as mentioned in the Majmu'a Ishtiharat that I have explained before, uh, was that the marriage of Mirza Sahib with Muhammad was Allah's irreversible will. Well, that never happened. Mirza Sahib continued insisting that one day Muhammad would be widowed as per the taqdeer e mubram almost until a year before his death in 1908. It never happened. My dear Ahmadi brothers and sisters, it never happened and the prophecy failed, and it failed utterly. For my Amity brothers and sisters, and believe me, I, I have a large Amity family, and many of my family members had not even heard of Muhammad Begum. Muhammad Begum is the Achilles heel for Amity Murabis, and they do get completely bamboozled and discombobulated. Uh, whenever we mention the Muhammad Begum uh, saga. Anyway, the questions I would like my Ahmadi brothers and sisters to ask their Murabis and other devout Ahmadis is why did Mr. Bassett compare this failed prophecy, firstly, with the marriages of our holy prophet, وسلم, with Hazrat Zainab, the divorced wife of his adopted son, and his other wives? This is at best misleading and at worst it's blasphemous. Ahmadis always try to, whenever they are confronted with an argument about a failed prophecy, they say, well, this happened with Azu Salaam as well, and it never is the case that that is a valid comparison. The comparison with Muhammadi is unacceptable in relation to uh, the marriages of our Holy Prophet Wasallam, because Mirza Ghulam Ahmad never married Muhammadi. And none of the wives, not one of the wives of our Holy Prophet وسلم, ever refused his proposals. Uh, it was a blessing for them to be married to the Prophet. Mr. Bassett clearly blames Imam Deen and Nizam Deen for the reason behind the prophecy. I have always said that if you ask an Ahmadi the directions from, let's say, London to Birmingham, they will first take you to Scotland. Um, and go into a big diversion and digression. So this was the big digression in this new video, that Imam Deen and Nizam Deen were the reason behind the prophecy. Well, Imam Deen died in 1904. Nothing awful happened to him. Um, Nizam Deen's daughter did die, but that was in a prophecy uh, that was written before the Muhammad Begum prophecy. So, and if Imam Deen was the villain, why did the calamity of the daughter's death befall his brother Nizam Deen? Imam Deen and Nizam Deen were uncles of Muhammad, as indeed was Mirza Sahib himself. 
And Mirza Sahib, remember, himself lost a child in, 19, in 1888. And therefore, uh, the calamity befell him as well. Mr. Bassett provides no evidence that Imam Dean invited uh, Pandit Lekram to Qadian. He needs to retract that. Mr. Bassett has failed to provide any evidence of blasphemy that was published ever by Ahmed Baig. Interestingly, um, I have a source who uh, has sent me archives of Noor Afshan, the magazine, and guess what? The 1888 uh, volume is missing. These volumes were stored in the Foreman Christian College in Lahore, and they have mysteriously disappeared. In Islam, the guardian and the parent or the parent of an underage girl is his bully and has every right to refuse a proposal of marriage. Ahmed Baig was Muhammadi's bully. And as a bully, when he rejected Mirza Sahib's proposal, a good Muslim would have simply accepted that and had just moved on. And in that case, Mirza Sahib defied the uh, accepted principle in Islam that a bully's permission is necessary for marriage, or especially if it's a young underage girl. The Murabis claim that Muhammadi Begum and her husband were spared because they repented. Repented for what? A Muslim man can marry a Muslim woman and that's not a sin. And by the way, Muhammadi Begum nor her husband ever repented about anything. So this again is all smoke and mirrors to justify and to explain why the prophecy actually failed and failed utterly. So my dear Ahmadi brothers and sisters, in conclusion, the Muhammadi Begum prophecy was a failure. Sultan Muhammad and Muhammadi Begum lived as in fairy tales, it is said, the endings lived happily ever after and had nothing to beg forgiveness for. They had done nothing contrary to the teachings of Islam and they never accepted Ahmadiyya. A letter supposedly written by Sultan Ahmed, uh, Muhammad sorry, in 1913 has three differing facsimiles um, in Ahmadi literature uh, and is almost certainly a forgery. It's not addressed to a named person uh, and subsequently was denied in a Sunni publication and Sultan Ahmed never, um, uh, Sultan Muhammad never um, verified this letter. It was published in 1913, long after Mr. Saab had died. Mr. Saab held this prophecy as one of the three great prophecies with which to test the veracity of his claims. So ask yourself, would you still believe in this man? And as I have said, this affair resembles a Shakespearean tragedy with the hapless Mirza Sahib spending 20 years of his life in pursuit of the unattainable woman he wanted to marry. Amadi Murabis will keep scraping the barrel trying to prove the prophecy was fulfilled. Remember, it's their livelihood. Amadi Murabis have to defend the indefensible. And Mr. Bassett's latest attempt and his al Hakam article written this month is simply more smoke and mirrors, full of untruths, glaring omissions, and downright mendacity. What Mr. Bassett and Al-Islam claim as new discoveries in this prophecy is nothing new. We knew it all along. Imam Din and Nizam Din are red herrings. They had nothing to do with the actual raison d'etre of the prophecy when it was made long after 1885. And lastly, my sincere advice to Mr. Bassett and Amadi Murabis is that, you know, when someone finds themselves in a hole, uh, the best thing to do is to stop digging. Thank you for your attention with this presentation. I'll leave you to decide in the end about this prophecy and look at it from uh, the perspective of a neutral person. If you were told this story, what would be your conclusion about the character of Mr. Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, Dr. Han, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, first of all, Bashir, for allowing me to present this. Uh, I have shared this presentation with quite a few people. My instinct is to, when I find something that's controversial, is to go into its depth, so I spent a lot of time researching this prophecy. As many 
people now know that I left Amity a, a couple of years ago after having been born in Amity and when I was aged 58. Uh, and it wasn't a decision that was made overnight. It um, took a long time, a lot of research. And my Amity brothers and sisters should remember that Mirza Sahib had said that if to test the veracity of my claims, you have to look at my prophecies. And if a single one of my prophecies has failed, then I am a liar and an imposter. So there were three great prophecies according to uh, Mirza Sahib, and they were addressed to the three great religions. Um, this particular one was for Muslims. Then there was the prophecy of Abdullah Atam. We can do presentations on those other two as well, which was meant for Christians. And that was an utter failure as well. Um, and the last one was regarding um, Hindus, and that was the prophecy of Lekram. And I've already alluded to that in that particular um, presentation. Uh, Lekram is very interesting. And there's a book written recently uh, about blasphemy and its origins in Pakistan. Uh, it's very interesting that Mirza, uh, the second Khalifa of the Ahmadi Jamaat, actually helped draft the blasphemy laws which came back to bite the Ahmadis in the end. And um, Lekram was a Hindu um, who um, had uh, taken in a person who uh, was an imposter. He was a Muslim, but he said to Lekram that I wanted to convert to Hinduism. And as it turned out, he took an opportune moment on the day of Eid, because remember the prophecy said that he will die on a particular um, joyous occasion. Um, and he was stabbed on, I think, on Eid by this man in Lekram's own house. He was taken to a hospital where actually an Ahmadi doctor was looking after him, as it happened, coincidence. Um, and so that, see, the thing is that there is this thing that's called the Texas sharpshooter. And what the Texas sharpshooter does is that he fires shots and then draws the bull eyes, bullseye around the, um, around the bullets. And so um, what uh, we see from all this is that none of his prophecies uh, actually succeeded. But the Ahmadis have perfected the art of uh, smoke and mirrors and, um, you know, um, throwing in other irrelevances like this particular one from the Ummah Dilemma guy about Nizam Deen and Imam Deen, uh, which is totally irrelevant to the Muhammadi Begum prophecy. And my own belief is that Allah Ta'ala has given us Muhammad Begum as a person who actually single-handedly uh, takes the rug from under the feet of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed's claims. So I'm happy to answer any questions if any Ahmadi particularly wants to come and join you, uh, Bashir, if that's possible. I know it's almost an hour now and I'm also happy to conclude here. It's entirely up to you. Uh, but I'm very grateful for you to um, allow me to make this presentation, which was the consequence of um, a number of uh, months research into this particular prophecy. And then when I converted to Islam, Sunni Islam, um, I, um, this was one of the first things that I had looked at, um, along with, of course, other things like the um, theological um, basis of the um, heterodox religion of Amadeus. Thank you. Sounds good, Uncle. I, I I posted the Streamyard link. Everyone can see it. And then uh, you want to go through some comments while 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 we wait. Maybe Brother Sasha Lang will show up. Happy. If any, if if there's any question comments specifically about this, we could address those first. All right. Well, let's see. Uh. Oh, we've got, I've got the recording of, yes, uh, you're right. Uh, this uh, comment is important. Uh, I have obtained for uh, the record. These were um, uh, published in a book which Mirza Sahib actually himself attested was correct. And that was fazl -e rahmani I think it was the um, Kalamatul Fasl. Um, and the, these letters, the most heartrending letter is that of uh, the poor um, Fazl Beg's wife whose marriage was threatened because of this whole saga. And she writes to her mother, it's a very, and I've got a recording of that letter. I forwarded it to you if you want to play the last letter, the fourth one, 
if you have time, that people can hear it, but it's in Urdu. And this poor girl is pleading with her mum that, look, mum, um, my marriage is on the rocks because of Mirza Saab. Remember, Mirza Saab was 53 years old and poor Mamadi Begum was about 13. And he said that, well, we're going to um, send someone to take me home. Uh, imagine, uh, you know, the disruption this whole affair caused within that family. And in the end, I think they were divorced. Um, and the sad bit is that at that time, there wasn't any uh, Ahmadi edict or fatwa that you can't read the prayers of non-Muslims, the janaza prayers of non ahmadis sorry. And poor Fazal Ahmad sadly died when Mirza Sahib was still alive. Imagine the death of a child for a parent. It can be the worst possible thing that can happen. And yet Mirza Sahib refused to um, read his funeral prayers, which is shocking. Totally. So, so we have uh, three guests. Uh, one is uh, Baz Ahmed, Shogun, and Amr. Which one would you like to speak to, Doctor Saab? Anybody? <laughs> it's up to you. All right. Uh, Baz Ahmed was the first one here. Uh, Baz Ahmed, did you have any questions for uh, Doctor Han? Okay, you get a few seconds, and then we move on. Uh, the next guy here was Shogun, uh, Brother Shogun. Do you, do you have any questions for us? <laughs> yes, I'm yes, alaikum, everyone. Uh, amazing work, uh, Brother Bashir and Dr. Star. I've been uh, listening to you, sir, for quite a bit of time, and mashallah, your composure and your analysis is just on point. And uh, may Allah reward you for the work that you are you're doing. And uh, my question is uh, simply uh, based on one point, uh, why doesn't the Ahmadi brothers understand, after reading what Mirza has said about Isa al -Salam and all these prophecies, they think about uh, maybe this person is not actually the right person, right state of mind as well. Yeah, well, thank you for your nice words. Uh, I really appreciate those and keep praying for us. Um, I think it's a case of, um, it's very difficult. You know, it's not easy when you're born in a particular religious family and um, but remember uh, that Azur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam right till the end wanted Hazrat Abu Talib to convert to Islam that was his uncle who had saved him who had protected him who had brought him up and imagine the pain that Azur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam must have gone through in that even at his deathbed he asked he pleaded with Hazrat Abu Talib um, that please do the Shahada and yet he didn't he said, this is the religion of my forefathers. Like, my forefathers, my both grandparents, may Allah forgive them uh, for their, um, you know, for their false beliefs. Um, um, uh, you know, it, and it is sometimes in, <laughs> I would dare to say that in Punjabi culture, because remember most of the Ahmadis are Punjabis in Pakistan and India, um, family is very important. You know, it's a bit like uh, the Sicilian Italians. Uh, and to go against the family's directions and uh, beliefs is sometimes a, an anathema type thing. It's anathema. And sometimes there is the fear of ostracization. And sometimes, you know, I've, uh, when I first found out about Mahmoud Begum, I knew about this case. Um, and in detail, uh, it was a family gathering in London. We were about to go on holiday. And I mentioned this to my family members, close family members. and. Hardly anyone had even heard of it, um, of the case. And I too, when I was young, uh, used to hear people talking about Mamadi Begum. I used to think that Mamadi Begum must have been a 30, 40 year old woman. Um, and I was shocked to hear that actually the first time that she was subjected to this pursuit by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was when she must have been either between eight and 13. And as I said earlier, to marry someone in Islam, a second take a second wife with permission and with all the justice that is afforded to both wives is absolutely allowed. But the wali, you see, if I had a daughter, I don't have a daughter, and if a 53-year-old man came and said to my uh, to me that, look, I'm going to sign this document for you, uh, but uh, Allah has told me that you've got to give me your daughter, mate, um, and I'd, I'll show him the door. Uh, if not anything, where I'm, I'm a pretty peaceful man. I won't beat him up, but uh, I'll say thank you very much, but no thanks. Um, you're already married, first of all, 
and um, it, it ain't happening. And, and in Islam, you see, as far as I'm aware, the wali has the say in that. The girl wasn't even a balif. So in answer to your uh, earlier question, there's uh, overwhelming evidence. I mean, the Wafat Masi, Khatm al all the other prophecies, the character, then the subsequent structure of the Jamaat, all these things are now clear as crystal, you know. But Allah Ta'ala also says in the Quran, and, Allah gives hadayat to those who he wants to give hadayat. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sir. One uh, follow-up question on this one. Uh, you know, the, the turning point for me, like I'm a, a Muslim, alhamdulillah, from the beginning, but I just started researching this when I saw it on Dawa Wise and everything, was the fact that he claims to have uh, been guided by an angel who named himself Tichi Tichi, if, uh, for lack of the better pronunciation. I mean, doesn't that raise eyebrows? I mean, you know, how can it an did, angel... Uh, yes, but apparently, the uh, Amidi Murabis did provide me an answer for this. I also asked him. <laughs> What's this Tichi wow. Tichi affair? And he said that Tichi Tichi, and I don't know, my Punjabi is not very good. Apparently, it's a Punjabi term that means helpful or something. I don't know, but it, he did give me some sort of an explanation. Uh, but I don't buy that, to be honest. Um, uh, and the whole, um, I believe in the Hadith that says that uh, prophethood uh, is now ended. And the only revelation that you can get is Mubashirat, which is dreams uh, that come true. Um, and in Ham, uh, Wahid, uh, like was uh, the, that used to descend upon Azur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was through Gabriel, through uh, Hazrat Jibrail. And the other thing is that each prophet had their own attributes. Hazrat Musa Alaihi Salam was Kalimullah, which means that uh, the person with whom God conversed, you know, and that's uh, it's amazing. Uh, but I don't think Mirza Ghulam and the uh, have revelations. Uh, I mean, if you look at I'd suggest to my Ahmadi brothers, because it's been translated, just start by reading Tuskara, uh, and you will find some amazing stuff in there. Um, finally, I, I have other brothers waiting. I think I'll just be respectful for that. But last point of the observation is he had plenty of time to write all of these volumes. I mean, uh, <laughs> his never-ending literature. I mean, I think uh, historically, no one who claimed to be prophet has written so much. And one that contradicts each other. Like, I mean, uh, well, I mean, this I, begs the question, did he write it all himself? I don't, I'm not an academic scholar. Yes, yeah, ghostwritten, I'm sure of it. It's, it's, a, I'm, it's I'm, absolutely a topic for someone's uh, doctoral thesis to look at the uh, amount, abundance of literature. I mean, he actually wrote uh, in favor of colonialism, let's take one topic. And he has actually said that I have written so much about it that 50 cupboards can be filled with the literature in praise of colonialism. And in this day and age, when we're facing what's going on in the Middle East, you try to ask anyone, mate, do you support colonialism? He'll tell you where to go if they're a good Muslim. Uh, yep, and then we're... I, I, yeah, I'm uh, just going to say thank you to, to, to Brother Bashir for giving this opportunity. And Dr. Star, I was really looking forward to speaking to you for nearly now two months. And I got my chance. So Jazakumullah khair. Thank you and great job. I'm, I'll be I'll be listening to the stream. Uh, I'll be offline now to give others chance. Assalamu alaikum. Sounds good, brother. And uh, uh, let me just say, uh, okay, the the reason the whole TTTT thing even came out is because Mirza Ghulam Ahmed didn't believe in angels. So he made, he, he made up these names and he made a mockery of the angels in Islam. And then uh, what else did he say? Uh, uh, okay, I, I don't remember the, the other one, but uh, so okay. Uh, next up is uh, Brother Amr. Uh, Brother Amr, do you have any questions for for the doctor? I have a doctor. Sakam, doctor, how are you doing? Waalaikum salam, fine, thank you. I've been like watching your podcast, like your like your lectures. I find them very interesting. Like I'm an academic person too. I'm studying physical education at a school in Illinois. I have a few questions, Dr. Sub. And yeah. Bashir Bhai, I appreciate your podcast and and I apologize for messaging you a lot because I'm a fan of yours too. Uh, no worries, brother. Shoot. Okay. I, please, uh, can you tell me your background story that became, that you became Muslim? Sorry, please. Can you say may that? Please may please tell your background story how you became Muslim? 
there is actually a video available on Bashir's channel, um, which was my first interview. But very, very briefly, um, uh, about three or four years ago, I um, had a sort of an epiphany. I started reading namaz five times a day and Quran. And I was an Ahmadi. You see, I was born in an Ahmadi family. So at that time, I said, this is the true Islam, to use a phrase borrowed from the Ahmadis, which is an abused phrase. Um, and, and I said, in that case, being an academic, uh, you know, I'm a scientist, uh, a doctor, I said, I'll research the, the Jamaat's um, literature. And very soon I found that it didn't make any sense to me, to be honest. So I would suggest people should read the books on the literature. Um, and some of it, it, there's no time, there's not enough time to go into detail. As has been mentioned earlier, a lot of it is contradictory, doesn't make sense. And um, then I looked at the character of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed and the prophecies, and they failed. And then around that time, in, coincidentally, you may remember there was a case about uh, a girl called Nida. And there was this um, uh, audio tape that came out. And that was like the um, uh, last straw on the camel's back, as you would say. Uh, and I said, this cannot be a right Jamaat led by a right person because no person uh, of right mind, and in particular, no Muslim, uh, would be talking to a girl who is alleging such unimaginable abuse, um, talk to her in that fashion. So I think that's very briefly, but there is a video, as I say, um, uh, a long interview that Bashir kindly did that explains my whole background of how I became a Muslim. Yeah, and, and and real quick, uh, Brother Amr, we, we can come back to you. Is uh, who is this Razi Allah uh, Noman? Is is this someone who's playing? Um, uh, who are you, brother? Do you have any questions for us? You got a few seconds, and <laughs> so okay, we're we're moving on from this person named Razi Allah Noman. Don't know who that is. Okay, and then uh, Riaz from Mississauga. Do you Thank have any you questions? Here. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm a, you know, you know me. I mean, I'm a fan of yours and your uh, Amdopedia, as I call it. So, but it's an honor for me to speak with uh, uh, Dr. Khan, and I, I've been listening to him. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, you know, throwing so so much light from a different point of view and that angle. So, thank you very much, Dr. Khan. We really sure. appreciate that, and you know, your time. Now, quick. Uh, I know there are other people waiting, so I'll be quick and short. Uh, I, I'm, I, I listened to what you said, and I think you have been soft on Mirza Sahib, and I think for a reason, because you have been attached to this community. The wording, the way he professed and, you know, he uh, spelled out his dreams and published it, it's ignob ignoble. It's, it's, igno it's really beyond, uh, below the belt. The language he used, the dreams that he, that he published about that poor lady, it's stalking. It's modern day stalking. If the if it were modern day stalking with law was there, it would have been applied to Mirza Sahib. So I think you have been soft on him. I think I, there may be a reason for that. But I would like to hear from your mouth why you have been soft on these things. And you haven't, you know, mentioned those uh, letters or th those dreams that were published. First question. Second one is that personally on personal note, I mean, I see a lot of uh, you know similarities between yourself and Dr. Abdul Hakim from Patiala. If you, 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 I'm sure you must be knowing him, and you know yes, the story. Abdul Hakim, Abdul Hakim, yes, yes. My son has uh, done some research on that as well. So, uh, are you facing the same kind of backlash? Because Dr. Abdul Hakim himself faced so much backlash from Mirza Kadiani, Mirza Ghulam Kadiani Sahib himself. Like they, they blame Muslims of whatever one like the bad behavior and the bad treatment but the similar treatment was uh, sort of uh, commanded by mirza sahib and was his community was told to excommunicate him so are you facing the similar situation i mean these are yeah. my two questions thank you sir thank you riyasab um, and thank you for your very kind words at the start um, the first question about the i intentionally didn't want to uh, this my, my presentation was a chronological explanation of so people get all confused because and don't go to any Ahmadi website where they will point to you the murabi will say here's a website here's the answer to Muhammadi begum it's not um i didn't mention that dream because it was too um 
let's say, I mean, let's not beat about, it's quite a disgusting thing uh, to uh, actually, even if he had had that dream, I would not write it down and put it out in public. And it's available in Tuskara. Um, and let's not go into the detail because I want to keep this. Um, and, and I'm not soft or anyone. Uh, I just use polite language. That's, my, um, that's the way I was brought up by my parents. Uh, I will never abuse anyone. I have never abused anyone apart from uh, and the only strong language I would use is against people who are killing my Palestinian brothers and sisters. Uh, but I, I think um, one has to be gentle. And the other thing is, if you are too, uh, if you come across as too aggressive and you know vocal, then it, antibodies are raised. And my message, my work is to try to convince my honest um, and um, curious Ahmadis who may not have had the time to read the literature. I'm happy to be approached. Bashir knows my contact um, to discuss. And the second question about Abdul Hakim. Abdul Hakim was right there at the center. In fact, Abdul Hakim was a great companion um, of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. So his um, reversion to Islam was a big shock. I am just small fry. <laughs> Nobody knows me. I wrote a letter, uh, but I forgot to tell brother, uh, the first person who asked me how I left Ahmadiyya. I actually, uh, in order to do the Itmam e Hujjat, I wrote a letter to Mirza Masur Sahib. Um, uh, with 10 questions. Um, and um, that was written in March 2021. And I still haven't had a reply. And I often joke that maybe his goat ate my letter. <laughs> so I, I don't know. Um, still, he's got time to reply to my letter. It's available. Uh, but uh, I have, thankfully, I come from a very good family. All my family members are very educated people. And those of my brothers and sisters and other family members who are who are still Ahmadi, unfortunately, uh, I have fantastic relations with them. And Alhamdulillah, I have not faced any persecution uh, and um, like Abdul Hakim did. I think those were early days of the Jamaat and they got a big shock with Abdul Hakim. I don't think my leaving the Jamaat is a big shock to the community because I'm not a big shot in the Jamaat and never was. Okay, and we're going to move to the next question. Uh, brother, uh, I think that was uh, Riaz. We can come back to you. but uh, and, I'll, and I'll just say, uh, Dr. Abdul Hakim even wrote a translation of the Quran that was published in the Review of Religion. So he was a big shot. He's translating the Quran and writing commentary on it. And if, if you really want to check things out, uh, he objected. I think it was chapter 2, verse 262, where um, Allah says... Uh, uh, some people will be saved, or actually, I don't remember exact, but it has to do with yeah, the uh, Sabians and the uh, Nasara and the Sabians. Right, right. But there's a context to that verse, and they were sort of ignoring it. But um, no worries, uh, brother Am Amr Qureshi. Uh, do you have any questions for uh, for Doctor Han? Assalamualaikum, Assalamualaikum, Rashi. Okay. Assalamualaikum, Doctor Sab. You okay? Wa alaikum salam. Yeah, thanks. Alhamdulillah. I uh, just wanted to say. Um, really enjoy watching you especially uh coming from a Qaidiani background um just a couple of things i wanted to mention the first one is did you watch last night's stream i did i feel so sorry for these poor chaps who um are being fronted by the jamaat i mean why doesn't mr masrur come i mean he gets paid hand i don't know whether he gets paid hands but he's the top of uh, the whole pinnacle of it and really, it's about time that he comes and he speaks with Brother Imtiaz uh, and has an academic discussion with him. Uh, you know, I recently uh, found out that he gave an interview, Mirza Masrur, to some foreign correspondent where he concocted a hadith, which doesn't exist. And this other uh, Murabi, his name is, he's an Irishman. What's his name? Um, Ibrahim Noonan? Yeah, yes. <laughs> Or Mr. Noonan, I hope he comes towards a proper Islam because he, I, I, he said that that hadith exists. Basically, the gist of it was that the hadith uh, that Mirza Sahib, Masrur Sahib said, and remember, this is a serious matter because anything attributed to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu that is not true is a pretty punishable offense. So Mirza Sahib was um, young at that time, I think, and he said that our Holy Prophet Sallallahu had said that in the 14th century, there will be a person who will be a reformer who will come and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I asked 
Noonan Saab to provide me that hadith. And he disappeared for eight hours and he must have consulted with someone and he came with Sunan Daud's uh, hadith about a mujaddid at the head of every century. And there are many mujaddids that can come at the head of any century for that matter and uh, reformers. Um, so that was the closest he could get that uh, to it. But uh, I mean, that's just like, you know, um, um, again, that business of you ask Amadi the directions from London to Glasgow and they'll take you to Paris. Of course. <laughs> I did watch the stream and I think poor Mr. Yaya is another guy, Dr. Yaya, uh, who uh, I asked him a question at one of the previous streams about this business of a woman conceiving without, um, uh, you know, the necessary <laughs> uh, prerequisites of how babies are conceived and he never answered it. Yeah, I think uh, the, 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 yesterday, MTRs, Brother MTRs mentioned it as well. They always seem to come back with your ulema said it. Your, I don't have any ulema. <laughs> what they don't realize. Ghazali, Ghazali is very good. Imam Ghazali, Imam Abu Hanifa's. Um, oh, um, yes, yes, yes. But they were using they were using names like Batalvi, which Sanaullah, uh, people that are oh, not. Mm -hmm. They just uh, maybe in their area they were well known, but nobody knows who they are. Um, uh, secondly, I mean, I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, I will contact you, Dr. Zahar. I'm actually looking at writing a book about this. Um, I want to uh, contact you, get some support of you. Uh, I know that uh, Brother Bashir has, I've mentioned this loads of time, Brother Bashir's uh, website is the place to go. If you want to learn or not know anything about uh, the guy, the only belief, but I wanted to put this together in like a paperback form, um, and inshallah, we'll contact you. I'll probably get your details of Bash. More than uh, happy. More than yeah. happy. I mean, I, I live in the UK as well, so. All right. No, I also um, once I retire, I'm a busy uh, doctor at the moment. Uh, once I retire, one of my plans is to write a brief account of my own biography uh, sure, uh, due to my journey towards Islam. Um, and it would be a privilege to contact you for you to contact me, and uh, we can uh, yeah, share yeah. thoughts. Yeah, well, because what what I find, uh, Doctor Saab, is uh, this new generation—they're not stupid. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> they question uh, quite rightly everything and one should. Yeah, and I think the 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 fear of being an outcast is one of the major players in uh sort of making the sway towards uh real Islam. Um anyway, thank you very much for your time. Uh Bash. Yeah. Oh yes, Bash, you've got you've got a debate on uh, next week with Khalid, haven't you? On Wednesday, uh, on my channel about hell, uh, is hell permanent or not, et cetera. Bring Dr. Ishar on if he's not busy. Sure, sure. Well, you know, so so look, in, in my personal life or my uh, professional life, I can work online, you know, but doctors can't. <laughs> doctors got to, they got to be there. It's a lot of hours, you know. The life of a doctor is not very easy, man. <laughs> yeah, maybe if, doc, maybe if Dr. Ishar has got 10, 15 minutes um, that day, I look forward to um, um, checking that out. Because Khal Khalid is uh, a character and a half. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll let you decide if you want to look into him. He's not hes not the, the sharpest tool in the box. Um, and also, Mo C, you know, Mo C from Speaker's Corner, he seems to be in the chat. Um, I don't he, know. If he wants to come online and have a chat, I think it would be a, a much better way of getting your point across, bro. Um, anyway, I'll leave you to a doctor. Please pray for me. And inshallah, I'm going to catch up with you soon, inshallah. And Bash, I'll give you a shout tomorrow, inshallah. Sounds good, brother. Asalaamu Alaikum, brother. Okay, uh, Dr. Han, uh, we can end it now. We've been going for an hour and 10 minutes, or we can, I think, uh, um, Amr has another question for you. So it's up to you. Yeah, Amir can ask a question. I've got time. I've got another 20 minutes before I have to go and eat. Okay, Sakam, doctor. Sakam, Mr. Bai. I have a question. I'm sorry, this may sound a little bit personal, but I apologize if it sounds a bit rude. Okay, you know how like in Pakistan, like the Ahmadis are not considered Muslim? Since you became 
Muslim, would it still say that in your certificate, in your passport or not? Uh, no, I don't have a Pakistani passport. Um, I, I, I never had a Pakistani passport. Um, oh. It doesn't affect me, but I, um, I, I think that th that whole is a separate discussion. Um, how it happened, uh, and it goes right back to uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed and his son, uh, Mirza Bashir, who did takfir on the rest of the Muslims. And then also Chaudhry Kufrullah, who in 1953 did a, um, sorry, uh, in 1953, uh, the riots, the first riots against them. I've done some research on that. And it's very interesting reading that Chaudhry Zafrullah, who, by the way, let's put this Chaudhry Zafrullah myth to um, its right place, for example. Amadis are very keen on bringing Mr. Zafrullah up as if what he did in the National Assembly of the, uh, in the General Assembly of the United Nations was for Ahmadiyyat or as an Ahmadi. He was a bright, excellent um, lawyer, uh, but he was actually in the employ of the Pakistani government. All the work that he did was for Pakistan. We'd like to see what uh, Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon is doing for Ahmadiyyat or for Pakistan. He's actually sold his soul to the devil and poses with the uh, Zionists and actually has offered full support to Israel. And he's one of, he's taken the bet, hasn't he? And in the bet, you have to listen to the Khalifa. So the Khalifa should tell him to just get his act together and resign from his post. He can still remain a lord because you can remain a lord when you cross the party. And the other one is the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. <laughs> and I won't say much about him in case he puts a lawsuit against me, but he's also an Ahmadi. But Chaudhry Zafrullah wasn't working on his own. He was working with the help and the support, and he was in the pay of the Pakistani government. Sadly, he even refused to say the funeral prayers of the Kai de Azam, who actually gave him the job. So don't talk to me about Chaudhry Zafrullah, I say to my Ahmadi friends. Firstly, he's, he's history now. And secondly, he, he wasn't working for himself, nor was he working for Ahmadiyyat. He was representing Pakistan. It was Pakistani policy that was working there. And the other, of course, is Professor Abdul Salam. I actually knew him. My father knew him. He was a good friend of his. He was a family friend, actually. And his father, in fact, taught me the Quran, how to read the Quran. Uh, and he gets brought out. But if I ask any ordinary Ahmadi, tell me, explain to me what his uh, theory of uh, the unified field theory was, uh, and they get bamboozled. I've read a bit of it, by the way, and it is fascinating stuff. Anyway, um, I've so taken... Right. Yeah, sounds good. And then uh, the final question or the final engagement is going to be with uh, brother uh, Asif Nadeem, to, just to give you, he's been around, he's a new ex Amity. Uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, brother Asif, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I listened to your uh, stream briefly, uh, you know, on a fast speed. Uh, uh, it's always good to uh, hear Dr. Saab. Um, uh, I have uh, watched him uh, many times. And uh, yeah. So uh, I just uh, wanted to join <laughs> and, you know, I didn't have any particular question. Uh, the only uh, observation I was just uh, about to mention, uh, as Dr. Sawa was saying, uh, you know, I have been engaged with uh, many uh, people here, uh, particularly uh, Ansar Raza uh, Sahib of, uh, uh, you know, Jama Andia professor or uh, whatever he is now. Uh, I work with him on Radio Andia. So uh, these people, uh, they do not uh, come up with a straight answer. Uh, as Dr. Saab knows, uh, he wrote a letter and never got a reply uh, because uh, they, uh, their uh, thing is uh, all around some, uh, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a hidden agenda and nobody talks about those things so yeah i don't have <laughs> any much I, I just have uh, 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 you know been working on my book uh, it's almost done uh, but Look here forward I, to, uh, Look forward to that yeah so i'll send you a little bit for review yeah i know there's a lot of things that the uh, amity will not know um, for example, the, the um, scrutiny of um, the funds, the companies in Panama and so on. When the Panama uh, Papers affair came out, 
there wasn't any official response from the Jamaat. There was somebody who spoke on behalf of, uh, to defend the Jamaat, but there was never a formal response from the Khalifa. And the same applies to the um, Nida case. They, they will keep it to very close to their chest. Uh, so the inner circle, I don't know how it works. There is an inner circle, believe me. Uh, definitely, definitely. Because, see, the thing is, uh, all of these are office holders. Uh, they have their invested interests. So, uh, you know, their income is uh, uh, their, you know, they cannot lose their income because uh, they did not uh, go for any other skills. And uh, they are uh, totally relying on uh on uh, you know selling what uh, is called religion you know uh, when but i have their career is their salary you see so they have to defend it. and i feel sorry for them i mean uh, i but in the end you're answerable to allah uh, you're they, not on your bank exactly <laughs> exactly so i presented so many uh, verses quranic verses to uh, ansar raza sahib and uh, they're there are clear verses, uh, especially like uh, if you go to Surah uh, Anam uh, or Surah Nahal and 71, uh, it clearly says that uh, whoever is uh, calling towards themselves, uh, they are not doing the right thing because the, the right path is only towards Allah. They, uh, there's no doubt about it. So, and... Uh, uh, the more I am talking, the more I am uh, getting uh, responses from Quran. The Quran has is an amazing book. Yes, it has exactly. all the answers. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for taking me on uh, here. Sounds good. And uh, with that being said, we're 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 gonna uh, end the stream here. Uh, Doctor Han, do you have any uh, last word? Is with you. Well, the last word is I appeal to all my Ahmadi friends uh, to kindly consider uh, what their beliefs are and um, to all the Muslim brothers and sisters to kindly pray for me and my family. And I hope you all have um, also the Palestinians in your prayers because that has cast a big pale on um, all the Muslims of the world. In fact, all decent, honest people. Um, uh, let's hope that there's an end to the massacres and to the genocide. And let's hope that the um, powers that be um, take the courage to indict people who are involved in this. Jazakallah.